You're listening to the Gratitude Podcast, episode 97. If you haven't done so already, make sure you subscribe. Well, instead of thinking about his own need and what he doesn't have, I said, I'll give you a bus ticket. And he got all the way to my house. And we spent two days packaging these things for people who have even less. So this was a man who lives under a bridge packing water purification systems and generators to go on a pallet to go to people who have lost everything. And he was so grateful. You know what he told me? He said, well, the only thing I really want is a shower. Could I take a shower at your house? And I know Robert for a long time. And of course it was fine. And in a beautiful uh, act of grace, the local news had heard about it and came and interviewed. And here's Robert on the TV camera talking about giving back. And I don't think they knew who he was until later. I told the reporter, you know, this man, um, he doesn't have a home. He is actually helping people who have nothing. Welcome to the Gratitude Podcast on www.georgeandbenta.com, where you'll hear a new story each week that will inspire more gratitude in your own life. Our mission is to inspire 100,000 people to discover how to feel gratitude and live a happy life through the amazing life stories of our successful guests and their actionable tips. And now, the host of our podcast, George Benta. Hi, Gratitude Seeker. Welcome to a new episode of the Gratitude Podcast. With me today, I have an amazing person doing some amazing things in the U.S. And uh, I'm really happy to share his story with you and uh, to share what he is doing and uh, how he is impacting the lives of others through gratitude. His name is Stefan. and um, he is from Keep Me Grateful or Keep America Grateful. It depends. It's a play on wor- words, and uh, I really love it. So, Stefan Youngblood, welcome to the Gratitude Podcast. It's very nice to be here. Thanks for having me. I'm grateful for being here. <laughs> yeah, my pleasure. I really love what you're doing, and I think that it's so important to get the word out and to for other people maybe to get inspired by what you're doing and by your story and uh, yeah and we will talk a little bit more about uh, your experience with gratitude as well and I'm sure that it's going to be a really interesting time together so uh, let us know a little bit about you about uh, your background your story and how you got to, to gratitude and to spreading gratitude in the states sure yeah I grew up in Maryland I was one of eight kids My mom and dad, I still talk to my mom and dad every single day. There were four boys and four girls in a very small house. And um, my mom always wanted us to study in college and go to college, even though she didn't or my father didn't. And um, they made us work to do that. So all of us worked to get through um, university. And I'll tell you one beautiful thing is I moved away after college to Hong Kong and I got a call. And it said, hey, are you coming back because mom is graduating? And I said, well, graduating from what? Well, she had been taking classes for 13 years while all of us were in kindergarten, first grade, second. The whole time, I thought she was just trying to get smarter, but she had been working on her college degree. So she graduated 13 years later with the youngest of my sisters, and they let them walk down the aisle together. And she went on. It's really amazing, you know. So I am grateful for her. She's been a great inspiration um, to me. And right after college, I really left to travel around the world doing music and drama and um, doing that in some uh, very needy countries. I think I realized how much I was blessed and gratitude meant something very deeply to me beginning that time. Yeah, I can imagine. It's it's one of those things that... um we only realize when when we get out of our uh, bubble, out of our environment, because we we are used to a certain way of living. And when we see other ways of living that aren't uh, as good as ours, we, we realize uh, the gifts that we have, right? Yeah. So my grandfather actually lived in my house too growing up. And um, for the last six years that he was living in, 
he was a stowaway on a ship from Calcutta, India. And um, I always had read books about Calcutta and different things. And I always wanted to go there. So on my initial trip overseas to the Far East, it was Calcutta that I wanted to go to, but I didn't make it on that trip. I ended up going to Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, and China. But I still had this desire to see this place that was very poor, and I wanted to try and learn more and make a difference there. So it wasn't until six years ago that I got to go to Calcutta. I was able to work with Mother Teresa's Missions of Charity and then to uh, New Delhi and some other places. But I think seeing how people live in different places, which I do here by working with the homeless, um, it really does make you appreciate life, appreciate every breath that we have, and you know, appreciate people too. Definitely, definitely. So tell us a little bit about uh, what you are doing with um, Keep Me Grateful slash Keep America uh, Grateful. Let us know where it all started and what you're actually doing. Yeah, so this is a very uniquely uh, timely campaign. So maybe you know this, but in our country, there's a lot of discord right now and uh, a lot of fighting. There's difficulty amongst races, diversity, politically, socioeconomically. And um, a few years ago, uh, one of our presidents, Ronald Reagan, had a, a slogan that said, uh, make America great. And then the current president uh, changed it to make America great again. Well, um, I was watching the news one night and sometimes you see a lot of negativity on the news. And I've always been more about trying to be positive and encourage people to be positive. And I heard somebody, some uh, keep America great. But what my mind really heard was keep America grateful because that's always been my thing, uh, gratitude. So I started to wonder, wow, I wonder if you were to adapt that as a slogan and sort of try to get it into the minds of people, I think it would be very catchy because this is um, almost iconic in an unusual right, way right now in our country. It's very popular. So to do this little um, slogan and then work on the words a little bit so it makes two meanings, uh, inside America is M-E. So it, on our hats and apparel, you see, keep me grateful. And so um, I do a little work with domain names and URLs. So I was able to secure uh, all the domain names. And, um, and then I was able to uh, get the trademark for it to maybe use this for something. And it started to get wings under it. People see it and their reaction is, oh, oh, I get it. It's every time. That's what somebody thinks. So um, uh, it's it's. It has wings under it right now. Some very beautiful things are happening in a very positive, encouraging, and unifying way. Yeah, I love that, and I, and it res this resonated quite a lot with me. Uh, I think that, um, like love, gratitude is something that can unify us, and it's something that I, I was always looking for. Um, teachings for wisdom that's present in every religion or at least in most of, of the religions of the spiritual views in the world and love and gratitude I found to be everywhere yeah. and uh, I th that's why I think that uh, gratitude unifies and the need to be appreciated and to appreciate and to give thanks is something that's present everywhere and it's it's really beautiful that you that you mentioned the idea of unification yeah it's so important uh um five six years ago i had the chance to go to nepal to go to mount everest base camp and that had always also been one of my dreams to go to Kathmandu and travel um up to base camp and it was just three of us going up the mountain for eight days up to almost eighteen thousand feet and it was my Sherpa, a Hindu, me, a Christian, and my porter, a Buddhist. And there's like an old joke, three people walk into a bar, you know, or so what well, was kind of like that. 
But just to have these two people to talk to the whole time and learn from and listen to, and um, it was a very unique, beautiful experience. And you see some of the similarities that we have. And um, we got so high one day, uh, I was very tired. They were used to this, but I wasn't. The altitude, it was giving me headaches and everything. And uh, there was one point where it was very difficult to go on. And I didn't want to go all the way over there and not make it. And uh, we were at 16,500 feet. And uh, I was trying to keep something positive in my mind to make me keep going. So I was looking for things to give thanks for. But there's no life up there. There's just people. There's just rocks and snow and the sky. So I thought, well, it's a beautiful day. And then I'd grumble, well, it's cold out here. (laughs) And uh, the one thing I did see that was beautiful was a little bird would keep flying around and he would fly in these little crevices in the rock. And it was really the only sign of life besides yaks and people that you saw there. And I asked my Sherpa, what is that bird uh, that's here? And he said, oh, that's a sparrow. It's a Himalayan mountain sparrow. And first I thought, did you say sparrow? And he said, yeah. Well, in the Christian religion, that's kind of a bird that we think of a lot because there's a verse that says his eye is on the sparrow, on the bird. So I know God's watching you. So for me, that was a very big reminder and something to be grateful for. What a wonderful story. And it's so interesting that we can actually find reasons to, to feel grateful, even though, even in those harsh situations and sometimes especially in those harsh situations like when when we're able to do it to find gratitude and to be able to uh, move things in in a positive direction that's that's one of the gifts <laughs> that gratitude gratitude gives us yeah and it's probably a gift and a discipline yeah and if the discipline can be worked like a muscle um it becomes easier sometimes it's difficult But if you look for times to be grateful um, and look for reasons, I try to keep my eyes open all the time. My normal work during the days is I I run a nonprofit that works with under-resourced and um, needy individuals. And my eyes are always open to um, a different lifestyle some of them have. Some of them live in tents. They live under a bridge. They live in shelters. And uh, I eat with them at a place called the Salvation Army. And these people who have very little, everything they have is on their back. Um, But they're very grateful friends and they've become friends to me. And I learned so much um, just trying to keep my eyes open to uh, life. And for me, it's a step at a time. And if you appreciate and look for good in the moment, you feel like today was a good day. It was a free day and a day that you lived fully. I, I love this. And I think that uh, the experience you, you can have with, with those people, and I, I know that you're, you're actually, um, you've actually given some of your T-shirts to, to homeless people, and uh, you have some stories about this. Can, can you share a few with us? Yeah, so um, I've been giving out clothes. We do projects where we give clothes and shoes and bus passes. And uh, yesterday we actually gave a car to a lady at the Salvation Army. She is a grandmother who is on dialysis and she is caring for six children there so that her daughter can work. And this is a homeless shelter. Well, she's been looking for rides to get around and different things when she goes to the doctors and takes kids. And our organization, when people know that we have a need, they give us things so we're able to get them to people who need them. So in a very beautiful day yesterday, we were able to go there and give this grandmother a Toyota Prius. And um, it was just amazing to watch that, to see her great gratitude. Now, she was grateful even when she didn't have it, she would just, she was such a positive person and keeping these children going, but she was grateful in a different way yesterday when I gave her the keys and the title to this car. So um, 
we actually had been giving away clothes for a while. And when I got these t-shirts, here's what I thought is really cool. When people come and volunteer in a uh, inner city or with the homeless, every time I see groups come down there, they leave and say, wow, I feel like that was more for me than it was for them. You know, I went down there, but I received so much. This has been years of me doing this and I keep realizing this. So I kind of think that maybe God uses people who have very little to teach us to be grateful. So this little, this little saying here, keep me grateful. When you see a homeless, keep America grateful. They actually do help all of us to stay grateful. So um, besides having a t-shirt to wear, they have been an incredible banner, you know, of gratitude to wear these around. And they also have been in on business meetings with me. And they say, Stefan, I think we should do this. And I think we should do this. And then they help me to fold and bag and package these T-shirts to go out. So it's homeless people helping. <laughs> wow. This, <laughs> this is very beautiful and very touching. Uh, it's it's a beautiful way of, of seeing life and seeing the, um, the experiences that they are having and what, what they are teaching us. And I, for instance, I, I have a habit of when, whenever I see someone that's either homeless or has some kind of physical disability, um, I feel compassion for that person, but I also remember the fact and i'm grateful for the fact that i am i am in a in a better situation and i remember remind myself the fact that i'm actually blessed to to have for instance to have two feet and to be able to move and to go wherever i want because i'm free from that point of view i can i can do whatever i want and uh for other people this might be possible, it, but it might be much harder, for instance. Right. So, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it's, uh, I think we learn a lot when we have our eyes open. We learn a lot uh, from each other about, um, about gratitude. So I actually try to just stay alive to the moment and see um, opportunities that there might be um, to give. You know, one of my friends, he lives under the overhang from a bridge and um, he wanted me to see where he lived one day. And I've never seen anyone live like this. So I drive him out to where he's going and um, we walked under a bridge overhang and he had all of his clothes in there and some canned food and everything. And I haven't seen a person uh, live like this before. It was my first time at this place. Well, I kept that in mind of how maybe how I could possibly help him. And when October came around, a hurricane hit in the Caribbean. And I spent the month of October in Puerto Rico in the Caribbean, taking fresh water systems and generators and some things. Well, I contacted my homeless friend and said, can you help me package up all of these things that American Airlines is going to help us uh, send? Well, instead of thinking about his own need and what he doesn't have, I said, I'll give you a bus ticket. And he got all the way to my house. And we spent two days packaging these things for people who have even less. So this was a man who lives under a bridge packing water purification systems and generators to go on a pallet to go to people who have lost everything. And he was so grateful. You know what he told me? He said, well, the only thing I really want is a shower. Could I take a shower at your house? And I know Robert for a long time. And of course it was fine. And in a beautiful uh, act of grace, the local news had heard about it and came and interviewed. And here's Robert on the TV camera talking about giving back. And I don't think they knew who he was until later. I told the reporter, you know, this man, um, he doesn't have a home. He is actually helping people who have nothing. So it's that kind of thing that keeps me going, um, you know. Wow, this, this is incredible. And I love how the story unfolded, the fact that he, 
he was giving back without uh, the need or the desire for recognition and uh, how, how this all happened and the fact that they didn't know that he was homeless and he yeah. was doing these amazing things. I love it. I love it. Um, you also mentioned that um, you, so you're not just um, working with homeless people, but also with uh, kids, with uh, older people. Uh, what do you do in that yeah. regard with, uh, with right. this project? So I teach an Alzheimer's and dementia class at a, um, a residential living thing. These are for people who are old and um, aren't able to live by themselves anymore. It's a type of assisted care. Well, there's a class that I do in their memory ward that helps them to recall. Um, it's using music therapy, basically. I play songs sometimes, you know, somewhere over the rainbow. As soon as I play that melody, they come alive because they remember it. Or a Frank Sinatra song, or I do a lot of old hymns. And it recalls memories that a person in their 80s and 90s, even with Alzheimer's or dementia, they remember these things and they become alive. I saw a man get up out of his wheelchair and slowly start to dance. And this has not, I see this all the time. I wish the whole world could see it, but it's like a miracle in front of me, the effect that music has on them. So we got finished the class last Friday and uh, I decided to ask them, I'm a little younger than they are. And I said, you guys, you know that I'm doing this gratitude project and they all know about it. I said, can you tell me one thing that you're grat uh, grateful for? And um, really beautifully, this 93-year-old lady, the first thing she said is, you? And uh, <laughs> it was really sweet that she's, that wasn't what I was looking for, <laughs> but it was really sweet. And I said, well, thank you. I really appreciate that. But they were grateful that I was there to play the piano and play songs and somebody was visiting them. And then they went around the room and just, talked about what they're grateful for. And I want to hear what a 90 year old person is grateful for. So this one lady across the room, she said, Stefan, every morning that I can put two feet on the floor and stand up, I'm grateful. I just thank God for that. And then she said, another lady said, I'm grateful for our loved ones. And I said, oh, me too, you know, my family and my kids. And she said, no, I'm grateful for my loved ones that have passed on, for all the things they taught me, and I'll see them again one day. So for older people, they, a lot of their friends have gone on. So they think of gratitude for people who have moved on, not just our children and friends and things like that. So one of them said for air, one of them said for hope. One of them said for the place they have to live and just beautiful expressions of, um, of gratitude. I asked a five-year-old, my granddaughter, and um, I made a little video when I asked her what she's grateful for. And she said, I'm thankful for people who help people. And then she said, and I'm thankful for food to eat and things to drink. And her mind was just thinking freely. Um, of what comes to her mind when she's uh, thankful. So I'll just tell you one other thing. We go on walks sometimes and we call them adventures. She's five. She has a little uh, pair of binoculars, little plastic binoculars. And I carry my binoculars and we look around and see what we can see. And I'm grateful for this time with her. So last week we went out, we were walking down the street and she reaches down and pulls up a little flower. They call it a dandelion has little like furry things and she blows it and they blow into the wind. Well, I forgot all about that. I'm 56 and I forgot, oh yeah, that's what you do. You look down and you see something tiny and this is an experience. So again, I probably see these things all the time if I were to look down and I probably see them as weeds, but to her, it's a dandelion, watch this. And she said, pop, pop, here you do one. So her gratefulness for that beautiful little thing, just so tiny, you know, uh, was beautiful. In that moment, I sort of cataloged in my mind, in my heart that, uh, hold on to this, this, so that's a five-year-old and that's a 95-year-old. 
these are such beautiful gifts that life gives us and um it's it's so wonderful that that you're able to appreciate them and i think that that this is one of the the things that are so valuable about uh gratitude the fact that uh we get to appreciate these gifts and these experiences and treasure them quite a lot and see see the beauty in them and uh realize how how amazing they are and i to, to be honest i couldn't believe that you you said you are 56 yeah <laughs> You, you you really don't look i was thinking that you, you you're maybe 40 or something oh <laughs> no so i have three children um 30 28 and 25 and then i have three grandchildren my daughter has two daughters and then my son had a baby last week he and his wife had their first and then my daughter's having her third next week wow. so i went from two to next week i'll have four uh so <laughs> I love my grandkids. Amazing, amazing. The the thing is that I was thinking, what's your secret? Like, oh, why do you look so young? But I think uh, <laughs> it, it it has a lot to do with gratitude and uh, with giving back and giving back, um, volunteering, doing things for others, is one of the the ways to to actually get into a more grateful state and to appreciate things more, right? I have people around me. There's some very wealthy people that I know. And um, I see that whole group of people, wonderful people who do give back. And I also have people who have nothing. And um, sometimes I serve as a sort of network between these two groups, helping this group to understand that group. And sometimes helping the ones who have nothing, the people who have something can help them. And I try to bring them. Um, together. And again, I learn a whole lot from that. I do want to tell you one thing, because this is important. I don't know if this will make it in the final interview, but it's personal to me. So I went through a very difficult time and uh, I've had five shoulder operations. I have uh, screws in both shoulders. And um, after a series of these operations, I became dependent on um, opiates, prescription pain medication. And it became a very, very difficult season in my life. Uh, right now in our country, the opiate epidemic is, it's unbelievable. It's one of the biggest um, uh, disturbances I think that our culture is going through from younger people to older people. So it was very, very difficult for me. And I had to um, kind of humble myself and call a friend and say, can you help me? to go into a detox um, program. And I wanted to be clean of all of this and I wanted to uh, have it out my body. So being someone who has existed, you know, sometimes in front of audiences when I'm performing and traveling all over the world, and then being in a detox unit in a hospital with um, addicts and people who've been through very difficult things, sometimes marks all over their arm. And um, it was a different life for me. And I didn't think, oh, I'm not like these people. I really thought, oh, I have a problem too that I want to uh, get help for. And looking around that place and being on my back and unable to help myself, I needed help at this point in life. It really made me attuned to other people who struggle. So when I meet homeless friends on the street and things now and help them, I can do it as somebody who's been there and someone who struggled and who has gone through recovery. And this is a very large part of the work I do, understanding that um, you get caught in seasons of life where it's difficult. But the gratitude I felt for the doctors and nurses and psychologists there, the counselors, and the gratitude. I was encouraged by people who have been incarcerated for years and now they've come out of a, a gang, they've come out of drug dealer uh, dealing and they were helping me. Um, I was learning from them. And someone once said that real humility is realizing that you can learn something from anyone. And unity is just corporate humility. 
if everybody is humble and thinks I don't know it all, you're going to get along. And in that place, there was quite a unity because we were all kind of at the bottom needing help to get up. And I am grateful for that season in my life and for the people who helped me in, in that season. And I'm trying to give back in this area when it comes to um, some of this opiate epidemic that's going on now. So it's one of the things I do with folks. Wow. I think this is an important story to, to share. And um, definitely the, the fact that we, we are humble enough to ask for help, to uh, receive it from people that uh, might not be the, the ones that we might think that they could help us or that they, they can teach us something. I, I I feel the same. Like I feel that I can learn from anyone, and I'm uh, constantly looking for uh, ways in which I can learn from from other people from all walks of life. And I, I think that everyone indeed can teach us something very valuable and uh, can make a difference in our life, whether it's a big difference or a, or a small difference. I I totally agree with that. Yeah. And, um. Like I was saying, a way of expressing, of living gratitude, of uh, experiencing gratitude is actually volunteering, doing volunteer work, helping other people, uh, seeing other life situations. How do you manage to do it? Like I'm sure that our audience uh, is thinking like with this, such a big family, with uh, so many things going on in your life, how do you manage to find the time to do this as well? Yes. Because, uh, probably, I, and I hope that some of our listeners will, will look into volunteering as well. And I think that this might be very helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, for a number of years, I was a school teacher. I taught kindergarten through 12th grade music. And I taught at-risk um, boys um, that had got thrown out of other schools. And I realized... I think I can have a bigger impact on people if I was in um, a nonprofit uh, sector. So I actually started a nonprofit. It's called When Grace Happens. And um, I specifically gear my days and my time to looking for opportunities. And I go to places where I know that there's opportunities that I can be of help. And when I talk about eating dinner with, um, at the Salvation Army, anyone can do that. Sometimes I don't even eat. I just have a uh, something to drink or an apple just to talk. Because in our culture, people go and do things like that at Christmas. Usually between Thanksgiving and Christmas, everyone goes to shelters. But I noticed years ago that uh, there was a vacuum the rest of the year. When January to Thanksgiving came, uh, these people were a lot of times by themselves and didn't have as much help. So I wanted to have a nonprofit where it was more relational. So I would say this to anyone listening that just start, just find someone uh, that you can listen to, that maybe you can find out a need from, um, but do something during the year, just volunteer at a soup line and watch what it does in your heart. Um, take some clothes that are in your closet, and give them away to a shelter or something like that. Um, for me, I decided to do it with most of my time and uh, people sometimes donate and it helps me to pay the bills. Uh, but my other income is working with things like um, Keep America Grateful, which is a small business to help um, support this. And then I'm able to give back and help the homeless more. So, um, People I know, I say, don't wait until you retire. Don't wait until you have enough because you will never have enough and you will always have enough. So you will never have everything you want. No, I got enough to get back. And you have it now. Both of those things are true. So you have time, you can take out time and it will change your life right now to get back. It'll change your expression of gratitude to help someone else. Exactly. And my experience, for instance, with donating is that when you donate, something really interesting happens in your brain. 
I so I I'm not talking about uh, the the amazing feeling that you get uh, through the fact that you're you're doing something for other people, but there's another part of it. When you donate, you're actually telling your brain that you have enough, and you have enough so that you can give to other people, and that's a beautiful that. pe- feeling. Yeah, I love that. So. Um, when I am at the Salvation Army, I find out what needs are there. I just ask them, is there anything you all need? So four weeks ago, I found out that this big shelter, there's a hundred people there. It's for women and their children. I found out that they needed lamps because there's a curfew. They turn the lights off at night, but all of the little dormitory rooms, they need some reading lamps because some kids still need to do homework. All I did was use social media and said, Hey, folks, Salvation Army has asked for 30 lamps and 40 bulbs. Can we do that? 48 hours. I had everything. No problem. People, because everybody just wants to know what can I do? So we took all of those lamps there. And what I did was instead of me taking them, I asked for some people to come with me. And then I asked the director, can you let us put them in the room? Because if we can have personal contact with seeing how people live, seeing how some of these families are in very small uh, quarters, it does something in our hearts. So um, we then found out that they would like some children's books and some planners, some uh, yearly and weekly, monthly planners for the women. These are women trying to get back in the feet. So this is easy stuff. I just put it out on social media. Hey, everybody, we need 50 planners and we're looking for 50 children's books. So again, everybody just gave it. Even people on the other side of the country, I told them, hey, if you buy the book at Barnes and Noble online, I'll pick it up and take it there. So here's the authors. Here's some of the children's books they suggested. You buy it, I'll pick it up. So today, right now, there's a lady delivering planners and books without me involved. She's doing it to the Salvation Army today as a night. And it's when they're doing a little fix up So all it was was something very tiny, finding the need, asking people, hey, would you do it? And then I try to give everybody a chance to be a part of it. Hmm. This is beautiful. And I'll tell you, when I went to Puerto Rico, people in Washington State, in California, in Arizona wanted to help. So I told them the same thing. We're going to take generators down there because they have no power. I said, you buy it online from Home Depot is a big store here, and we'll pick it up. So it worked very well. Someone in Arizona bought a generator online. I would have someone pick it up and bring it to the platform at American Airlines. And then everybody was helping to do something just by finding out what the need was. This is wonderful. This is wonderful. And yeah, it's, it's such a beautiful feeling and such a, such a beautiful experience to be able to do this. And it's really... So I don't know if you know this theory, and uh, it it works in practice as well. Uh, whenever you don't have something, the way to get it to to be able to uh, get back on track with that particular thing is to give it away. Like if you if you don't have money, the best way to get more money is to give it away. And this is counterintuitive. Like it it doesn't make sense logically, but it works and uh, for instance for this for this case it works because when you give you understand that you have enough and you make sure that you you find a way uh, to to do to get by with that even though you were you were able to donate and this works well with uh, for instance if you need to be listened to to listen to other people oh that's good so maybe it works with time too yes, i was just yeah. thinking if you think you don't have enough time to do something, give some away and you will have what that makes sense. That's really good. Yeah. And a great way of doing this is like you were saying, volunteering, helping people that have less, uh, helping people uh, like just listening to them. And yeah, totally not just doing that in certain months of the year, because most probably in those months, there are a lot of people doing this, but you can do it throughout the year and uh, it can yield great benefits for you and um, for that person as well. 
Yeah, I've, I've learned from going to um, third world countries. I was in Burma uh, two times, um, again, doing a recording project, and then I was teaching a music class there. And I was there before the country really opened up to the rest of the world. It was very closed. And um, I saw a culture in some places that didn't have much of anything at all, very uh, poor. And it taught me a lot that I don't just have to go to a third world country to see that type of thing because it's right here. The opportunity to help someone is here. But my mind and my spirit are in, come alive to distinct needs that are around me when I'm overseas in a third world country. And then I'm able to translate that to here. Now, you don't have to go there, folks. You can do something right down the street. Or maybe there's someone in your neighborhood. And I really don't I don't have money to give away money and it's not always good to give everyone on the street money. I don't do that. But I found out that a creative thing we can do is give out bus passes, a bus pass. I buy in bulk. I buy 300 at a time and I get them for a little less. And they are like a piece of gold to a homeless person because they can ride a bus all day. They can go to job interviews. They can get out of the rain. They can um, just be warmed up for a little while in the winter or cooled off in the summer, and to be able to get out of the little area that they can walk to and be able to take a bus anywhere is a big thing. So we found that um, we've encouraged people, instead of money, maybe just have some extra bus passes with you, That, but try to do the conversation with that, because the, the conversation is everything. Yeah, I, I think it's about... Uh, that person being actually being seen and actually being acknowledged, right? That's that's that word is so big. That word to see someone, uh, I think it's one of the greatest needs in the human soul to be acknowledged, valued, accepted, uh, listened to. And when I mentioned earlier that our country and many countries have so much discord and disunity. I think it's because one side doesn't feel listened to or doesn't feel valued or looked down upon or something. Uh, but that unity that comes with humility of listening and looking and seeing is a very good thing. And sometimes we have to look way past the outside because it's a person deep inside there that has feelings and a heart and a spirit. And um, God created that person just like he created you. Um, so, yeah. What you said is my biggest thing in life, that someone would be seen. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. And I think that this is the best way to, to end our time together. But before that, uh, let us know where we can find you, where we, can we see your work and get in touch and maybe even volunteer right beside you? Sure. Yeah, so my nonprofit is called When Grace Happens. When Grace Happens.org is a nonprofit and we do all kinds of different work right now. We're giving away another car tomorrow. So yeah. people help just, they help us do this. So we're doing books right now, the book collection, some flowers for a shelter, the planners, a car and our bus passes. Those are projects we're involved with. And then outside of that, the little business that I'll be able to help some more homeless people with this that we're doing is called keep America grateful. And we have t-shirts. We've like made them in all kinds of different colors and everything. And now we have hats that have come out that just say, keep America grateful. But what they really say is keep me grateful. And what they do is open up a conversation about gratitude. So people can find that at keepamericagrateful.com. And what we've asked people to do, even if they don't buy any T-shirt or hat, just hashtag one thing that you're grateful for and put a hashtag, keep America grateful. And then Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook bring all these things together. So we've been doing interviews and videos and just quotes from people. I interviewed a guy on the street yesterday. Um, I asked, what are you grateful for? And for 15 seconds, he wanted to tell me and we put it on a little video. So anyone around the world can uh, say one thing that they're grateful for and just hashtag keep me grateful or keep America grateful. This is beautiful. And I think it's, um, it's something that's very important. Like 
we are part of something bigger and um by keeping ourselves grateful we keep the the country grateful and i i really love this this idea and this uh way of uniting people in gratitude and through gratitude well i i really am grateful for what you're doing it's a very big thing to give a voice to people who believe in being grateful because you're serving as a reminder for all of us we listen to you and think oh yeah i need to do that and if we forget a little while oh yeah that's right i need to do that so thank you for the reminder it's really influencing a whole world to remember gratitude wow my pleasure thank you so much thank you Thank you for listening to our weekly podcast. Help us reach our goal of inspiring 100,000 people by sharing this podcast with your loved ones, with your Facebook friends. And if you loved this episode, please write a review on iTunes.